do we have 20 of? So I think we can start. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this last Compass Friday seminar in fall 2020. We have one more seminar on Monday morning, but this is the last regular Compass Friday. Our speaker today is uh, Kathy Gunn, who has worked with uh, Lisa Beals group for a while. Um, her biography here says she studied geophysics at the University of Leeds in the UK. Then she went to the University of Cambridge to do her PhD, combining geophysical and oceanographic techniques in a new discipline called seismic oceanography. And she already gave the presentation on that in the compass, uh, I think maybe two years ago or so, one and a half year ago. Um, then she came to Miami to, <clears throat> to work with Lisa Beal on the Ebola system, climate array, and um, that's what she will talk about today. So the, what she sent me here yesterday said this is the result of the first completed project in, on, on this uh, topic. So uh, let's see what she uh, has to say about it. Okay, thank you. Okay, can you see the slide there? Perfect. And can you see my mouse? Yes. Okay, excellent. Okay, so thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm just going to get rid of these faces. There we go. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about the results of an analysis of salinity variability in the Agulhas current. And this work was a collaboration between myself, Lisa, Shen, Kay, and Adam. And these are all people that are at Rasmus or were recently at Rasmus in Kay's case. And so I'm gonna put uh, the problem into context before we begin. So the Agulhas current acts as a barrier between the shallow shelf seas and the open ocean on average. And it's expected that variability in the Agulhas current will alter the distribution and properties of water masses, both within the current itself and on the shelf. But a lack of observational data has hampered our understanding of exactly how and why water masses vary. So in this work, we tried to address that gap in our knowledge by analyzing the spatial and temporal variability of salinity across the current, where we're assuming that to first order, salinity is a conservative tracer of water masses. Oops. Um, okay, so here is the outline of my talk. So first of all, I'm gonna give uh, some background and some motivation for this study. Then I'm gonna talk about the data that we used and the methods that we applied. And then I'm going to talk about the results. And I split these results into three parts. So first I'll talk about the time mean salinity distribution um, that we ended up getting um, from our data set. Then I'm gonna talk about the effects that meanders have on salinity variability. Now meanders are when the Agulhas current shifts offshore from its mean position by about hundred kilometers. I'm also going to talk about the effects that current pulsing has on the variability of salinity. Where current pulsing here, I mean changes in the strength of the long stream jet strength. Um, and finally, I'll conclude. So to orientate ourselves, here is a map of the southern portion of the Indian Ocean. So we're looking at uh, 24 south to 44 south there, 20 degrees east to 120 degrees east. And we have South Africa here, and we have the Agulhas current flowing forward and hugging South Africa, shown by this black uh, arrow here. And we have Australia on the right hand side. And these symbols, these triangles, squares and circles, 
show three hydrographic crossings that occurred in 1987, 2002 and 2009, and nominally they're located at about 32 degrees south. And these crossings were collected as part of the WOS program, and they give us a synoptic view of the water masses at those three discrete points in time. So we can use that data to investigate variability of water masses at decadal timescales. Now, aside from these data, we do have higher resolution information um, around and across the Agulhas current. So um, if we focus in on this box here for now, so this red line is the location of, oops, excuse me, is the location of a focus campaign to further understand the Agulhas current. So in particular, there was a study in 2014 um, by Greta Lieber amongst others, where they analyzed four hydrographic transects collected on that line. And those transects were collected between 2010 and 2013. So it was approximately annual time steps. And that study observed changes in temperature and salinity of up to one degree Celsius and 0.25 PSU. So it's quite large changes and those changes were occurring at shallow and intermediate depths. And one of those transects captured the Agulhas current during a meander. So if I mention this again, so a meander is when the current shifts offshore laterally by about hundred kilometers from its mean position where the arrow here is approximately showing its mean position. So the meandering um, was observed to drive isopycnal uplift of about 100 meters, and that acted to cool and freshen water above the thermocline and also on the shelf. Now, as that meander propagates southwards, its trailing, edges, its trailing edge causes down, uh, downwelling, and the, that uplift is mostly reversed. So the variability that was associated with that meander was mostly reversible. Now, interestingly, this study also found evidence of irreversible variability in the term, uh, in the form of diapycnal mixing. So when I mention um, reversible and irreversible variability throughout my talk, um, by reversible, I mean heave of water masses, so uplift and downlift, and by irreversible, I mean some type of mixing. So due to the gaps um, uh, of about one year between those sections, it was not possible for the, um, for the study to determine how often these processes drive variability and salinity. And furthermore, um, it was not possible to think about what else might be um, driving variability in the water masses. So they looked at meanders, but there might be some other processes going on. And since that study, hydrographic measurements across the Agulhas current have remained um, fairly uh, discrete and infrequent. So this leaves us with a gap. How and why do water masses vary in the Agulhas current? And so we address this gap by analyzing the spatial and temporal variability of salinity. So we're going to zoom into this box now. That's this um, box shown in panel A. So where does our spatial and temporal information of salinity come from? It comes from this, oh, sorry, my mouse is very sensitive. Um, the Agulhas System Climate Array or the ASCA experiment. And ASCA recorded temperature, salinity and velocity time series between April 2016 and June 2018 across the Agulhas current. And it recorded that information along this thick black line here. And this experiment provided the first continuous measurements of temperature, salinity, and velocity. Previously, there were continuous measurements of um, velocity that were collected during an experiment called ACT, and that was collected at the same location here. So the array um, is orientated approximately 15 degrees um, from uh, perpendicular from the main axis of the jet, where the jet is highlighted by these gray arrows. So they are the annual drifter derived um, near surface currents. And these labeled white circles here are seven tall moorings. And the white triangles here are the location of current and pressure recording inverted echo sounders, so CPIs. So if we look at the vertical cross section of this array here, so on the X axis, we have the range, which is the distance from the coastline going from the coastline here at zero to 300 kilometers offshore. 
and we have the depth on the y-axis. So we're going down to a depth of five kilometers in this plot. So we see here are seven tall moorings um, labeled A to G, and these um, constrain the region between the coastline and 187 kilometers. And those moorings were fitted with um, seven upward looking ADCPs or acoustic Doppler current profilers. And those were upward looking ADCPs that measured, um, that gave direct velocity measurements between the sea surface and 500 meters depth in hourly ensembles. We also had current meters shown by these squares. We had 23 of those and they collected point measurements of velocity uh, recorded every uh, 20 minutes. There were 56 microcats, so these are CTDs that collect um, information about the pressure, salinity and temperature, um, and they provide that information every 20 minutes. Now, if we look from 187 kilometers to 300 kilometers, um, the moorings were augmented by these sea pies. So these are shown by these white triangles at the bottom. And sea pies are bottom deployed instruments that measure the acoustic round trip travel time. And that acoustic round trip travel time is directly related to the integrated properties of the water column. So if you take your acoustic measurement and combine it with a lookup table of hydrographic data, you can extract full depth vertical profiles of temperature and salinity. So this method is called the gravest empirical mode uh, or the GEM method, and it fits that data um, empirically. So in total, um, this experiment had 90 instruments that were deployed across nine sites. And the average vertical, uh, sorry, horizontal and vertical spacing between those instruments was 30 kilometers and 300 meters uh, respectively. So once all of the um, salinity records were collected and quality controlled, we low pass filtered them uh, with a 40 hour cutoff and that removed inertial diurnal and semi-diurnal variability. And then these measurements were subsampled at 20 hour intervals and their discrete pressure levels. So discrete pressure levels defined by um, where the instrument is. So here I have plot the cleaned and filtered temperature and salinity data in TS space. So the black data, uh, the black points here are the uh, measurements collected during ASCA, so between 2016 and 2018. And the gray points are um, temperature salinity measurements from CTDs, Argos, et cetera, extracted from the World Ocean Database. The solid black lines here are neutral density surfaces that are used to define water masses in this region, as I've labeled here. And I'll go through the names um, and these water masses uh, later on when it becomes appropriate. So we had all our data that was cleaned and filtered, um, but one issue that came up was that there was a lack of information in the upper water column. So if we look at panel B, um, this is an example uh, data set for mooring G, so these red points here, where the shallowest microcat was at 500 meters. So you can see that we're missing um, some information uh, near the surface. Um, and it's possible to extrapolate um, from the shallowest microcat up to the sea surface. Um, but that created a lot of errors because it tended to overestimate that sea surface salinity. Um, so what we did was we used satellite data to recover that uh, sea surface salinity. Now, rather than using satellite derived salinity products, uh, we use satellite um, derived temperature products and a local TS relationship. And we did that because um, satellite uh, salinity products have quite low temporal and spatial resolution when compared with a micro cats, um, whereas the temperature data has a very high resolution. So these local TS relationships, here's an example, were derived for the upper 20 meters of the water column for each mooring based on this um, regional world ocean database um, of information. And then we, what we did was we extracted our sea surface temperature at every mooring and every time during the experiment, converted that into salinity and then interpolated between that sea surface measurement and the uh, shallowest microcat. 
So panel C here shows the result of doing all of that. And these are the time mean TS um, profiles for each mooring colored by the distance from the coastline. And overall, we recover the cross stream gradients. So the horizontal gradients of salinity, if you imagine we're going from the coastline here to 300 kilometers. So we recover those horizontal gradients of salinity well. Um, and beneath a depth of about 200 meters, uh, we recover the vertical um, uh, structure of salinity well also. Now, one issue um, was that we didn't recover a subsurface salinity maximum, um, a, a, a shallow subsurface salinity maximum. But we found that using the satellite data in this way uh, reduced our error, um, uh, our vertical error. Um, so at this point, we linearly interpolated between the moorings and then we gridded up the data. So we had um, a vertical sampling of 20 decibars and a horizontal sampling of 500 meters. So here is the first set of results and we're looking at the time mean salinity. So once again, we have the distance from the coastline or the range in kilometers on the x-axis and we have the depth on the y-axis. So we're looking at the 26 month time mean salinity field for the ASCO experiment, where the shading here is the salinity. And um, just to point out that panel A is from zero to one kilometers depth and panel B is from one kilometers to five kilometers depth. And throughout my talks, all of the figures which are shown as a function of depth will have, um, will have this structure. Um, so what we can see is that the shallowest water masses, subtropical and tropical surface water, um, have a salinity of about 34 point, uh, sorry, 35.5 or above. Um, and they extend to a depth of a few hundred meters. Beneath those water masses, we have South Indian central water, which is slightly fresher, 34.9 to about 35.5. And all three of these water masses slope towards the southeast and they form a wedge. And South Indian central water is um, uh, what mostly makes up the halokine water here. So beneath South Indian central water, we have our salinity minimum, Antarctic intermediate water. And this has an average salinity of about 34.5. Now this water mass is quite thick, it's 1.2, um, kilometers vertically, and it uh, lies at an average depth of uh, 1.4 kilometers. Then beneath a depth of about 2,500 meters, um, the deep waters are generally laterally um, homogeneous, and we have this uh, subsurface salinity maximum of 34.8 here, which co is consistent with North Atlantic deep water. So North Atlantic deep water enters the Western Indian Ocean around the tip of Africa. So in order to make sure that the um, data analysis that we're doing and then the subsequent gridding was robust, I compared the time mean gridded section of the salinity field with another field that was interpolated from this regional in situ data. So what I did was I took that WOD, um, that World Ocean Database um, uh, of information, and I extracted all the profiles that were in 50 kilometers of the ASCA transect and projected them onto the transect. And you can see the location of those profiles by these white circles. And basically what this is showing us is that the overall tendency and the thickness of the water masses matches well. Um, so it's uh, showing us that our uh, methods are fairly robust. Now, the biggest difference here in the time mean is that North Atlantic deep water for the ASCA time mean is not uh, laterally continuous. Um, and that's probably to do with this, um, we don't have a microcat here. Um, so we've kind of, um, I hope, convinced ourselves that our gridded salinity field is robust. So then what we can do is think about the variability of that field. So here we're looking at this time mean, but we have this gridded um, section or this gridded information at 20 hour time steps for 26 months between 2016 and 2018. 
So we have a wealth of, the, of spatial and temporal information that we can take advantage of. So what we decided to do was to perform an empirical orthogonal function or EOF analysis. Now, formally, uh, this method decomposes the time-space matrix of salinity measurements into the sum of a space-dependent mode pattern multiplied by a time-dependent amplitude. Now, those time-dependent amplitudes are also known as principal components. And in simpler words, um, this analysis tells us how much each spatial point in the gridded field varies around a mean with time. And it also separates that variability into modes. Um, so we use that analysis, but what we were also interested in was separating the signals of reversible and irreversible salinity because of the intriguing results from Greta Lieber's work in 2014, which I mentioned at the start of the talk. So what we did was we performed that EOF analysis in both depth and density space. So in depth space, variability that emerges from that EOF analysis can be considered a measure of the total salinity variance, which can be either reversible or irreversible. Then if we reconduct the same analysis in density space, the variability can only be caused by an irreversible change in salinity. So the salinity itself has changed permanently, changing the density, and we can pick out that a change in the EOF analysis. And I'm gonna talk about the results from these analyses now. Okay. So here we have the dominant mode of variability of the salinity field calculated in depth space. So this mode accounts for 41% of the salinity variance. In A and B, uh, we have the space dependent pattern, which I'm gonna call EOF1. And the uh, style of this figure is the same as we've seen before. So we have the distance from coastline on the X axis and the depth on the Y axis. And the red blue shading here is the salinity anomaly, um, uh, colored according to the scale bar. Now in C, the thick black line is the time dependent amplitude of EOF1. So the time dependent amplitude of this EOF, um, which we can also call a principal component. And I'm gonna label it PC1 as shown down here. So PC1 is a function of time and that's the time during the ASCA period. And it has an amplitude which has been normalized between one and minus one. Um, now the red line here is the sea level anomaly, um, which is shown on the right hand axis. And we use a sea level anomaly threshold of minus 0.2 to define meanders. And where the sea level anomaly hits that threshold, I've highlighted those times uh, by these gray squares. So these gray squares indicate that we have a meander occurring. So this, that explains um, these figures, um, and now let's interpret them. So we can take EOF1 here, panels A and B by itself, and it tells us that in this mode, there is a large amount of change in South Indian central water and in Antarctic intermediate water. The changes in Antarctic intermediate water have a lower magnitude, but are quite widespread. But then we can take EOF1 with its principal component time series to examine how that variability changes with time. So if we focus on this region highlighted by the arrow, which is picking out one of these meanders, um, we can see that during meanders, we have a positive um, principal component. So we have positive values on this black line here. So that means that during meanders in this region, we have that positive value multiplied by the anomaly, and we have a freshening of in salinity in South Indian central water. So we have a freshening of minus 0.4 here. At the same time during this meander, we have a salinification of about 0.05 PSU in Antarctic intermediate water. Now, what we found is that the correlation coefficient between um, the sea level anomaly time series and the principal component time series was very high. And you can see that by I, and I've annotated the number here. So that correlation coefficient was minus 0.8. 
So this indicated to us that meanders are the, are the driver of this mode of variability. So meanders are the driver of most of the salinity variability. Um, so we took this step, uh, this one step further, and we wanted to see exactly what the meanders were doing to the water column. So we compared the principal component time series to the time varying depth anomaly um, of water masses. So in blue and orange in panel D, I've got the mid depth anomaly of South Indian central water and Antarctic intermediate water. And the important thing to take away here is that negative values indicate shoaling of the water mass. So what we can clearly see is that during these meanders, both of those water masses shoal, so they're uplifted. Um, and this is as expected. This is what's been found before, um, and, and we observe it for every single one of the meanders that occurred during the ASCA experiment. Now, due to the vertical salinity structure of the water masses in this region, where we have Antarctic intermediate water, we have our salinity minimum um, at a depth of about 1.4 kilometers. Shoaling will cause freshening above the halocline and salinification below the halocline. And then the opposite occurs um, as after the meander passes, where we get deepening of those water masses. So next, we wanted to separate off the signals of irreversible salinity change by reconducting that EOF analysis in density space. So the dominant mode of variability in density space accounts for 48% of the variance in salinity. And in A, what we're looking at here is the distance um, from the coastline on the x-axis again. Uh, but on Y now, we're looking at neutral density. So to get these um, these figures, what I did was I um, projected this salinity from depth space into neutral density space and then just re reconducted the EUF um, analysis. Um, and we can think of this neutral density space as, as water mass space, if you like. So similar to EUF1, um, DEUF1, which is what I'm calling this, um, shows two main regions of variability. So we have this region of variability in South Indian central water and also um, subtropical central water. And we have <clears throat> a region of variability in Antarctic intermediate water. And we find um, uh, for the principal component time series for DUOF1, we also find that during meanders, we have the freshening of this water mass and salinification of this water mass. Now, what this analysis in density space tells us is that these meanders are associated with irreversible variability, so some form of mixing. And because these salinity, um, these patches of salinity variants were semi-vertically aligned, we inferred that this was to do with um, diapignal mixing. And we wanted to test this hypothesis. So we examined the thickness of the water masses. So here I have the thickness of South Indian central water in blue and the thickness of uh, uh, Antarctic intermediate water in orange. And sorry, these are thickness anomalies. Um, but the take home is that here, the negative values indicate thinning. So during a meander, South Indian central water thins whilst Antarctic intermediate water thickens. And the correlation coefficient between the thickness anomalies of those two water masses is minus 0.7, suggesting that they're exchanging between themselves. And then we compared um, the, thick, those, uh, the thicknesses of those two water masses with those directly above and below. So subtropical surface water, tropical surface water, and North Atlantic deep water. And we found a negligible correlation coefficient, suggesting that the exchange is, is limited to South Indian central water and Antarctic intermediate water. So from this, we concluded that diapignal mixing is occurring between the central and intermediate waters during meanders. Um, now here I have a quick summary of um, the changes that we found that were associated with meanders. Um, and I want to explain why, why we think these results are interesting. So 
The first reason is that we now have observational evidence that upwelling and also dipignal mixing occurs during all meanders during ASCA. And there were five meanders that occurred during ASCA. So this suggests that these processes are common, if not ubiquitous. And that was one of the gaps that we had earlier on in our understanding. Um, the other thing that we find is that heave is occurring, uh, occurring fairly uniformly throughout the halocline here, whereas diapignal mixing is found preferentially between about 60 kilometers range and 120 kilometers range. And that range is the inshore flank of the current after it shifts offshore um, during a meander. So during a meander, the jet sits um, sort of in between moorings F and G. So in this region, we're on that inshore flank of the shifted jet. Um, so in the Gulf Stream, um, if we switch to the engulfed stream for a second, intense diapignal mixing has been found at the flanks of meanders due to frontogenic processes, so specifically enhanced vertical shear. So it's likely that something similar is going on here. However, we weren't um, able to um, confirm this hypothesis um, with, with the data available. Um, but we found that quite interesting. Uh, so the other thing um, that we thought was quite interesting about these results excuse me, <clears throat> was that smaller sub scale lateral shifts of the current also drive reversible and irreversible variability in the salinity field. So these sub scale shifts I'm defining as lateral shifts of about 50 kilometers or lower, and they're resulting in salinity anomalies of order 0.1 PSU. So um, still very large change. Now, what the important aspect of this is that in a given year, those small lateral shifts occur for 111 days of the year, whilst meanders only occur for 43 days of the year. So the sub scale meandering of the current um, is an important driver of uh, subsurface salinity variability. And it's something that might be missed if you're analyzing this, say, from using satellite data. Okay. So now onto the results that are associated with current pulsing. So here we have the second largest mode of variability of the salinity field in depth space. And this mode accounts for 25% of salinity variance, and it's associated with changes in the long stream jet strength. Here, I've got the principal component time series in black as usual. And the red here is the along stream jet strength. So it's the volume transport of the agullus current. So what we found is that when the strength of the jet is weak, so around um, 50 sphere drops southwards, um, isopycnals flatten in order to adjust geostrophically. Now that flattening close to the continental shelf causes the halocline waters to deepen which causes a salinification. Now, as that isopycnal is flattening, it also causes the um, uh, isopycnals further offshore to shoal, and that causes a freshening of the, water, of the water masses here. So if you imagine a pivot, and we've got the uplift of the water masses, um, which I explained earlier on. So, um, and that shoaling there causes a, a freshening pattern. And we see the reverse during strong periods of the current when the transport is above about 100 sphere drops southwards. And that's because we get steepening of the isopycnals and the reverse pattern. Um, so we get salinification there and, uh, sorry, freshening there and salinification there during strong periods of transport. And so in order to test that, what we did was we looked at the depth anomaly of South Indian central water at 40 kilometers and um, South Indian central water at 140 kilometers. So this is mapping how that water mass moves at these two regions. And we found that indeed, so if we go for a strong example, um, offshore as these isopycnals are steepening, we get the offshore region deepening and the onshore region of South Indian central water shoaling. So again, we separated off the signals of irreversible salinity change by reconducting this EUF analysis in density space. And here we have the second largest mode of variability in density space. 
and that accounts for 15% of the variance of salinity. And it's also associated with current pulsing. So similar to EOF2, DEOF2 shows these two um, uh, regions, onshore and offshore regions of variability. And once again, we found that during weak pulses, um, we had salinification of about 0.2 PSU onshore and freshening of uh, about minus 0.1 PSU offshore. So again, what this analysis in density space tells us is that this mode is associated with some form of irreversible variability, so mixing. And because the um, salinity anomalies here were horizontally aligned, we inferred that this variability was due to a long isopycnal mixing or cross-stream uh, mixing. And so and that inference is supported by the high correlation of this mode with changes in the slope of the subtropical and central water masses. So here in the red line, I've got the change in slope of South Indian central water and where positive values here indicate the flattest slope. Um, don't worry too much about the numbers, but what we're looking at here is that the red and the um, a uh, black line are quite highly correlated. So they have a correlation coefficient of uh, minus 0.7. So interestingly, we saw that the salinity anomalies here, which we're um, interpreting as being related to a long isopycnal mixing, we noticed that they're sharply attenuated between moorings A and B. And between mooring A, uh, A and B is the mean position of the jack core. So we think that the spatial limit is likely caused by the jet's uh, large cross-stream potential vorticity gradient, which is inhibiting cross-frontal mixing. So our conclusion is that current pulsing drives um, a long isopycnal mixing in the anticyclonic or the offshore flank of the jet but, there is, but we don't find evidence of cross-frontal exchange of waters. So where cross-frontal exchange of waters would be, be occurring around here. So um, finally, my conclusions. Um, so I'll just go through these conclusions. Um, so we found that changes in the location and strength of the Gullis current at 34 south drive water mass mixing um, across and along isopycnals respectively. We found that meanders cause vertical uplift of water masses that result in a freshening within and above the halocline and salinification below. And that heave is reversed after the meander passes. Those meanders are also associated with diapycnal mixing at the inshore flank of the jet. We found that current pulsing, so changes in the strength of the um, jet, cause changes in the depth and the slope of the halocline in keeping with geostrophic balance. And during weak transport anomalies, salinification and freshening of the near shore and offshore halocline occurs as those isopycnals flatten. During transport pulses, where the transport is um, uh, anomalously large, the pattern of near and offshore anomalies is reversed. At the same time, that change in isopycnal slope encourages cross-stream mixing. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me now or send me an email. My email's up there. Um, and I'd also uh, like to take this um, time to say that, that this work has just recently been published um, and is online. And I'd also like to signpost um, an excellent paper by Kay, uh, which is also online now, and they investigate the temperature variability of the Agulhas current. So if you're interested, you should go and check out that paper. Thank you. Okay, very nice. Um, if I can just uh, say a few words now before questions. Oh, um, sure. Because I would also like to um, congratulate Kathy, who will be soon moving to um, another position in uh, Australia to work at Cicero with Steve Rintall and, um, and Matt England. So congratulations on that position, Kathy. We'll really miss you. <laughs> and I want to further congratulate her because she got a, a, a NASA grant funded as PI um, and has the ambition to come back to Rosenstiel School 
um, and work on um, some seismic oceanography, uh, which is really how she cut her teeth as a PhD student. Um, so we're really excited, um, you know, with the prospects of having Kathy back in the near future. So well, very well done, Kathy. Excellent work. Thanks, Lisa. <laughs> Yeah, if someone else has a question or comment, uh, I suggest that you activate your camera and microphone. Maybe Arthur, did you did you turn your camera on to say something? Well, I'll let the students go first with uh, the questions. I'll ask a qu uh, question uh, later on. Really nice yeah, talk. Okay. Uh, that's that's a good idea in theory. Unfortunately, they usually don't ask a lot of questions. All right, so I'll start uh, off with question. Manish, may, maybe Manish has a question. Yeah, can I ask a question real quick? Um, very awesome talk, it's super interesting, Kathy. And congrats on the position in Australia and the grant, that's super cool. Um, I was just wondering, could you explain a little bit more about why the the modes in density space are have to be diapycnal mixing i i didn't entirely follow that i just could you explain that a little bit more? yeah so what we what we were the idea behind it is that if you get a change of salinity in neutral density space basically the salinity has changed permanently mm -hmm. Um, so that salinity has changed and we'll record that in density space rather than that salinity has changed by some sort of uplift that we might map in, in depth space, but that could be reversible. So if we, and what's actually happening in that uplift there is that actual salinity might not be changing, it's just moved to a different position. Um, so we were kind of trying to split it off where in depth space, it could be a change due to um, uh, 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 sorry, in depth space, it's a sign of the total variance. So it could be due to that uplift or it could be due to some sort of mixing. But in density space, it's only due to mixing. So a permanent change in the salinity. Okay. Well, helps. I guess I was just thinking that couldn't some kind of salinity anomaly also be invected through in a density layer? Is it, maybe I'm not understanding. It just seems like in a density layer, you could also have a salinity change that's invected through that layer that wouldn't necessarily be mixing. That's a good point. Um, and I I'd have may, to think I, about that. I think that that wouldn't sort of appear because of the way that we do the analysis. So we're sort of thinking more in terms of um, the ver because we remove the mean. So. Okay. I'd have to think about that. But with the time series, that would probably come up. And we could maybe pick out if there was some sort of advection at a given time. I have to think about that a bit more. If I if I may hop in, um, Manish, I think that the because the along stream differences in the water masses are very small, um, then it's unlikely that you know we we're gonna see strong signals related to to that so but but we're at a front right we're at a very strong front where we've got really large cross stream gradients in the properties and okay, so that's yeah. that's where the very you know that's where the variability is coming from okay. yeah that makes sense thanks all right i'll i'll follow up on that um all right so since you're doing the analysis uh via EOFs, which explain variance. In that location where you see uh, most of the variability, you could calculate what the overall variance is in the data set. Now, this is in a fixed grid. If you move a meandering current uh, past the fixed grid point, that's going to contribute to the variance. You know the horizontal gradients. You know the distance the current is meandering. So you could estimate the contribution uh, from horizontal meandering to that EOF signal, and you may be surprised how big it is. Yeah, really good point. Um, so we did consider this, um, and I think, I guess, 
one way, and Shen might have a comment on this. Oops, if I just go back. And, and, sorry, and just let me add to that, you know, you, you could also get uh, extra variability from just modes going, you know, from the system going up and down that you could calculate from uh, the, the salinity gradient in the vertical. So just from things moving vertically and horizontally, not necessarily mixing, it may be there's a lot of variance in there and it may actually, by calculating those components of the variance, it may actually give you a feel for how much variance is actually due to the dipixel mixing. That's just a suggestion uh, to, you may want to look into for this work. Okay, yeah, no, that's a great suggestion, thank you. And I guess, um, so back to the point that you just made, <clears throat> in a way, because we've done this analysis in a fixed um, grid. And we did do that because we, you can then do the analysis in a, in a moving frame, but we decided not to. Um, and there's probably a reason why, but I can't remember exactly. But in a way, the signals that we're seeing, some of those might be a bit smeared. Um, but we are, but despite that, we are confident with, um, you know, people have already seen that meanderings causing these changes. Um, but your other point is a great, that's a good suggestion. Thanks. Yeah, I, I've done a bunch of EOF analysis uh, through the years of uh, uh, different uh, data sets. And a lot of the variants you see in those uh, data sets are in regions of large gradients. And if you get the systems moving, um, you get, that's what actually explains the variance. And in many cases, it explains the majority of the variance. So definitely okay. look into that. I would well, suggest it. Yeah, maybe. I enjoyed your talk. It was very good. Thanks. Thank you. Maybe I'll follow up with you. Uh, well, I'll definitely follow up with you after after send you an email. So, Arthur, if I can follow up on your question, do you think that the the work that we did to look at both um, in the geopotential space and the neutral density space. So that was that was our attempt to separate the movement of the front but, from any changes in the water masses. Do you think that we should, is there something else we could do to? Well, um, I mean, the, the horizontal coordinate is still a, a fixed, Eulerian coordinate. And so any meandering of gradients, especially large gradients, I mean, you could estimate the size of this, you know, fairly easily by just knowing the gradients, the, the amount of distance they move and compare it to the overall variance at that spot uh, in the data set. And you, and you may get an idea of the vertical modal movements, um, you know, due to say just simple first paraclinic, you know, vortex stretching over the topography you know, that amount of vertical movements may be sufficient to, um, you know, give you a, a large amount of that variance. And then if you do that part of the calculations, it'll give you a, a better feel for how much of it is related to mixing as compared to, you know, current structures, both horizontally and vertically moving past the fixed point. And, 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 and yeah, and, and to do the variance analysis in a you know in a moving coordinate system is not easy. It's 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 a bit of coding. It, it's nothing. It's it's nothing you just throw together in a day. I think that's why we decided not to do it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you could spend a year just on that. But yeah, <laughs> anyway, we can talk about it another time. Okay. Any further questions or comments? I don't see any. So thank you, Kathy, again for the nice presentation. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, before we end, I would like to advertise something. Can you see this? Um, so you see the polar stern there, I hope. Am I sharing the yep. right window? I hope. Yeah. So that's the Polar Stern, the German icebreaker. Gunnar Spreen was on it during this uh, icebreaker project uh, that 
went for a whole year to the, towards the North Pole and he will talk about it on Monday morning at 10 a.m. He will focus a little bit on remote sensing, but he will also show us some more of these photos. So I think that will be a very nice last presentation before Christmas and I hope many people will come to that uh, last, uh, last uh, compass seminar in this year. So that's all for today. Thank you all. Uh, happy weekend. Thank you.